Hi, I'm Jacqueline. And I'm Courtney. And this is Caffeinated Crimes, take four. (laughs) We are having a good time today. Um, I don't know, my computer kept disconnecting um we started to record and i just said what and courtney's like that's not that's not how we start this podcast i was like wait a minute (laughs) is this a new podcast (laughs) courtney's like i don't i don't know how i feel about this intro we should like say our names i don't like the what (laughs) (laughs) yes and then of course like we do and by we i mean mostly me but sometimes courtney get the giggles and then just could not get it together so take four here we are Hopefully everything is, it looks like it's recording correctly, so Mm -hmm. hopefully that is the case. Um, Hopefully you guys liked our Zodiac two-parter. That should be, hopefully you've listened to that one by now if you're listening to this one today. So Mm -hmm. that one was a doozy and some two very long episodes. Yeah, and apparently reading one of the letters, um, I thought it was just gibberish, and it was actually a song, so thanks Catherine (laughs) for pointing out that I just was poorly reading a song, because... I didn't know it was a song, and I probably sounded like an idiot. <laughs> Courtney and I laughed so hard oh when we read that, gosh. and we discovered that. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you guys also <sighs> thought the same thing, sorry about that. Um, but you know, it, it is. I'm what sorry. It is, I guess. I'm I'm a young millennial who uh, <laughs> doesn't know anything. No, but. <laughs> it was, too good and if you're a patreon you also got the adam walsh bonus so we covered yes. that and covered code adam so if you're like wait what's that somehow um join <laughs> patreon and you can find out <laughs> yeah definitely um we have a lot a lot of true crime updates today mm-hmm. because things are happening in the true crime world in the last couple of weeks so we're things just gonna are, uh, happen in yeah (laughs) yes yeah lots of things that we're gonna dive into before we get into today's case so courtney hit it okay (laughs) so we haven't (laughs) hit it (laughs) so um we do have an update from a previous case so if you listen to our case um a while back i can't remember exactly when we released that but it was quite a while ago i'd like to say maybe a year ago but don't quote me on that but uh faith (laughs) hedgepeth Um, We did that case. It was in North Carolina. She was found murdered in the apartment she was staying at, and there was just no resolution to that case. Well, we did have an update. Someone was arrested for her murder. So it was 28-year-old Miguel Enrique Salguro Oliveras. Sorry if I butchered your name, but you're a murderer, so uh, I guess innocent, (laughs) possibly guilty, but... (laughs) Um, I was like, wait, throw that in there. I don't want to get sued. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But basically, we... As far as we know, we do not know what the connection between Faith and Miguel was. Um, What we do know is, if you remember from that case, there was um, DNA and blood left over. And it does seem that there was a DNA match with Miguel. So it sounds Mm -hmm. pretty sure. Um, Hopefully the police will release more. I get it. They're probably just trying to keep everything super tight to just make sure Mm -hmm. nothing goes wrong. Um, But we do have an update in that case. And I mean, this case is almost 12 years old. Um, It'll be, Mm -hmm. I mean, not 12, 10 years old. Nope. (laughs) I was thinking because it happened in 2012. (laughs) Oof, guys. Courtney's really good at math, guys. It's fine. (laughs) I am great at math. Uh, Kevin makes fun of me all the time for how bad I am at math. Um, but that's why we have calculators on our phones. We yeah. don't need to know math anymore. <laughs> yeah. So the case is almost 10 years old. So if her family could, you know, get some resolution, um, obviously mm. it will not bring Faith back, but it will get this guy who's clearly a murderer in jail. Yep. And um, the next update we have, which apparently I've been living under a rock because I've never heard of this case and Courtney made fun of me. So <laughs> sorry. Um So, Maura Murray disappeared in 2004. Um, She was in a car accident and her car was found, but she just vanished and has never been seen since then. So, they did find human remains at a ski resort in New Hampshire. Um, And so, I guess one of the theories in this case was that three men, I think, three men, Mm -hmm. had taken her to um, a ski resort. So, they have not positively identified these remains, but they think it's possible with the location, um, I guess, the condition of the remains. You know, we don't have a whole lot of details, but they are suspecting that it is her. Uh, But we'll get back to you once we have more information or, like, a confirmation of that. 
Yeah, there hasn't been too much released besides the fact that remains were found and people are like, oh my God, is this it? Because Mm -hmm. a lot of what I see like on Twitter, on TikTok, don't judge me, (laughs) um, I'm on true crime TikTok now, is people just kind of being like, this could be it. Like, Mm -hmm. this could be her. Um, We don't know, but I mean, this is also one of those cases where I see people um, put this up with like John Benet Ramsey of like, if I could solve one case, it's this one. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, she literally just, disappeared which is so crazy air, like just gone so yeah if we hear any more about that we will update you um again we're just gonna keep rolling on with these updates so <laughs> robert durst was officially convicted of the murder of susan burham so this story did gain popularity with the hbo documentary the jinx um and it's one of those that i think not everyone realized he wasn't convicted yet everyone's mm-hmm. like oh i thought that was resolved a long time ago yeah. um but he was officially convicted. Um, I saw pictures. Homeboy's not looking good. <laughs> Mm-mm. Yeah. Mm-mm. He needs to, I don't know what he needs to do, but he's <laughs> not looking good. Um, but he will probably spend the rest of his sad life in prison. So. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so our very second episode that we ever did was Lacey Peterson. Um, so I think we've talked about this, um, some of these updates recently as they've come out. Um, So Scott Peterson's death sentence was overturned. Um, So he did get resentenced, and this time it just came out this week. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Um, So no longer sentenced to death, but he's still not going anywhere. So, yeah, because I think around the time, um, I think people were thinking he was going to get a whole new trial, but like whatever was in the appeals court or whatever it was just his like sentencing not Mm -hmm. necessarily like his whole case i mean not to say that won't happen but Mm -hmm. for now he's still still in prison yep so if you've been paying attention anytime in the last few years to true crime you know the name samuel little um he basically came out that he was this huge serial killer who had all these victims and no one really knew about it. Um, Mm -hmm. But it does appear another one of his victims has been identified. Um, So there were the unidentified victim remains found in 1977 and they named her Eskatapwa Jane Doe. I hope that's right. I'm really sorry. Um, (laughs) But she has officially been identified as Clara Birdlong. So um, she is believed to be a victim of Samuel Little, uh, would not surprise me with how many victims he has Mm -hmm. but um crazy that 1977 and now in 2021 we're finally identifying this victim Mm -hmm. i think we've seen this a lot lately with these old cases being solved with dna or new technology so hopefully more of these victims will get their names back yeah um i read that before he died he did confess to murdering someone like in that same area like where the remains were found um back in 1977 so they're pretty sure that you know he basically he confessed to this murder before they knew who she was so um like he didn't know her name or anything like that um but again i'm sure whatever family she has left appreciates you know being able to have that little bit of closure Yeah, and we wanted to go ahead and put a trigger warning right here. So in this final update, as well as our case for today, we are going to be talking about domestic violence. Um, I know domestic violence is a very triggering topic and has happened to a lot of us or affected a lot of us in some way. So we wanted to go ahead and put this trigger warning here so you're not surprised. We will be talking about domestic violence for the rest of this episode. And now finally, what is arguably the biggest... um breaking news story in true crime in the last couple of weeks, um, of course, is Gabby Petito. Um, So she was 22 years old and she was on a cross-country road trip with her boyfriend, Brian Laundrie, and she had been communicating with her family. And then, you know, she, I think she FaceTimed with her mom the last time, like towards the end of August. And then they texted a few days after that, um, but they're not sure if that was her or not. Yeah, I was actually just reading an article that was saying, like, they texted very frequently, and then they got a t- her last text from her said, no service in Yosemite, which mm-hmm. now they're not sure if that was actually her yeah. sending it, um, or if that was kind of a cover-up. But, yeah, so it was like, they were in communication a lot, and mm-hmm. then that text came, nothing else. 
Yeah, so her family did report her missing when they didn't hear from her for a long time. Um, and then Brian Laundry showed up at his parents' house alone. Um, and police were trying to get in contact with them. Like, they would not respond, you know, to phone calls and things like that. And then they finally responded, I think it was, like, almost a week later. And then they were like, oh, well, we, he left the first day he arrived and we haven't seen him since then. Which is um, very suspect. So mm-hmm. um, he is on the on the run. Um, there is a warrant out for his arrest for using her credit card. I believe is what they were able to um, get an arrest warrant. Yeah, like right after, because her yes. remains were found, um, and it is believed that it was homicide. And it does appear after that would have happened that he did use her card. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty suspicious there too so yeah so they did confirm um that they found her remains at the grand teton national park which is in wyoming um so you know she never made it back from their trip his family lives in florida um i Mm -hmm. think hers does too i think they live in new york never mind his family definitely lives in florida so he arrived back alone um and her remains were found way back in wyoming um Mm -hmm. and had been there for yeah, you know, a few weeks. So yeah, um, and this has also brought a lot of criticism in the media for a couple of things. Um, so one of them being the fact that young, pretty white girls always get this national attention when they go missing, and people of color often don't. Um, so we just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, we do try really hard here to cover updates of everything that we hear about um unfortunately courtney and i are not a national news media site um i know that might be kind of confusing you know case (laughs) but anyway um (laughs) so you know we can only cover what we hear about and what we know from our areas or what we do see on national media um but that is a big issue um that needs to be resolved or handled better um especially with native women as well i mean i think we've talked about that before that there's just this huge number of missing and murdered native women um so yeah so we we do the best that we can but we understand that that's not good enough because we just don't have other information on some of these other cases um but we do also still want to remember and acknowledge gabby and not take away from her situation and murder when we're also remembering the others. Like, we, we need to be able to recognize both of them. And the other thing that um, this has brought up a lot is the... I can't remember the article I read, what they called it, but basically, like, how ethical or, like, moral, like, true crime media is. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of people that are, like, diving into the Gabby case and kind of treating it like a game versus, like, hey, this person is actually missing mm-hmm. and she has a family and, like, they make it out to be kind of like a fun murder mystery game. And it's like, that's not exactly what's... Yeah. That's not the way it should be handled. Um, So I've seen some criticism with that. Um, Again, also, we try our best to respect the victims and to make sure that we're not playing into that killer fantasy, killer sensationalism that we've talked about before. Um, not This isn't a whole thing to talk about how great we are not doing that at all, just trying to acknowledge where we and, you know, other media like ours could do better yeah yeah it is i think a very fine line with true crime of you know you have this fascination you know and yes um you know a lot of times too it can just be i don't want to say like a coping mechanism but you do think like mm-hmm. one of these crimes is like honestly sometimes like the worst thing that could happen to you depending on what yeah. the crime is you know and you know, you read about it because you're like, okay, let me like know everything about it to prepare myself or think about this or think about that. And Mm -hmm. um, there is, you know, a lot of good that can come out of like true crime, knowing true crime, you know, the whole, you know, so much advice given from these big podcasts, you know, of, you know, crime junkie just being like, hi, like be rude to people, like be rude, Mm -hmm. act weird, just like, (laughs) <laughs> Don't even fucking worry about it. Like, if it saves your life, yeah. who cares if they think you're a lunatic? Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's it's a fine line. Um, and anyone who does, like, have critiques, like, towards us, if we are downplaying anything, like, please let us know. Like, we'll fix yes. that. Like, we do try to respect the victims and respect these stories. Um, but it, it can get tricky sometimes when you do read so many stories and you are trying to devote mm-hmm. it and, like, 
just keep us in check. I know you guys will, but. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. This Gabby case, um, we did this update last because it does tie in very closely to what we're talking about today um, because Gabby was in a abusive relationship. Um, I know it did come out mm-hmm. like at the beginning, people were thinking she was the abusive one and that was not true, that Brian was very mm-hmm. abusive towards her, making her out to be like the quote crazy one or the, you know, mm-hmm. all this. Um, and that's another thing this case brings up is... It is hard for women to leave abusive relationships, and sometimes that is the most dangerous time for a woman when she does leave. Um, So don't blame Gabby or the woman in our story today or Lacey Peterson, anyone else, for not leaving their abusive relationship because we should be teaching our partners, man or woman, to not be abusive, basically. (laughs) Teach Mm -hmm. teach your children better. (laughs) So... Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and this case today is a suggestion from Catherine. We mentioned her a few minutes ago, 20 minutes ago. I don't know. Never. Um, <laughs> these long <laughs> updates. Um, and she wanted this to come out on October 1st and messaged us back in March. So thank you because we do not understand concepts of time half the time. So thank you for reminding us <laughs> way in advance. That's what we need. Um <laughs> Yes, this has also been on our Google Doc since then, and Courtney and I are, like, working away and doing these episodes, and a couple weeks ago, Courtney's like, okay, I'm going to, you know, start on this one because it's going to come out the week after Zodiac, and I was like, no, that comes out in October. Oh, God, October is, <laughs> like, three weeks away, <laughs> so yeah. time just is flying always, really, but this year it seems especially. Yeah, and especially with these podcasts, too, because we're usually researching further out in advance and not necessarily thinking about the dates they will come out more so just like when we're recording Mm -hmm. and then when we upload we're like oh yeah it's coming out whatever you know Mm -hmm. so our resources for today are a bunch of bbc news articles um the alice ruggles trust.org um an anthony collins website and rescue.org and a blog called talk murder with me So Alice Ruggles was 24 years old when she was murdered by her ex-boyfriend who broke into her apartment in October of 2016. He had been stalking her after their breakup. So Alice Ruggles was born on December 24th, 1991 to parents Clive Ruggles and Sue Hill. And she was the third of four children. And this family was very, very close. They're a very tight knit family. And she grew up in the Leshire village of Terlangdon. I tried really hard, guys. Look up all these pronunciations. I'm so sorry if I butcher them. Um, Let me know. I'll issue a correction if I can. (laughs) So Alice was always described as happy and outgoing. She was able to just cheer anyone up who was down. She loved to make jokes and pull pranks. She was very quick-witted. She was a great listener, and she was very empathetic. Um, And she really just, like, made friends wherever she went. She had a very, like, outgoing personality, so she would just become best friends with whoever she was around. Um, And she was a natural entertainer, and she loved to sing in school concerts or at karaoke with her friends. So Alice was also very outgoing in high school, and so she helped to arrange the school ball, and she would help younger students with their Duke of Edinburgh's award. So I looked this up, and it seems like a program that allows kids to discover new interests and talents and kind of help them develop some, like, essential skills for life and work. Now, again, this is based off of a Google search. So if you're in the UK and you're like, girl, that is not right, please let me know because it's kind of hard with these, like, cultural things to, like, fully understand. Um, Mm -hmm. But sometimes when I listen to the Red Handed podcast, which is a British podcast, I hear them talking about US things, and I'm like, that's very wrong. So I it's so funny. I love it. It is because they're like, I think it's this. And it's like, no, but I see why you think that. Um, (laughs) So if this is wrong, um, I'll write a strongly worded letter to Google. Just kidding. But if it's wrong, let me know and we'll (laughs) correct it at some point. I'm sure Google would um, be very upset and make it right (laughs) right right away. (laughs) They're like, we don't care. (laughs) So she also discovered fencing at the age of 11. And so she specialized in the epee. 
Um, and she even represented her home country of Leicestershire and the East Midlands region on many occasions. Um, she was also successful on the national fencing circuit, and at the age of 18, Alice was looking at different potential universities based on the strength of their fencing clubs. So she ended up choosing Northumbria, where she became club captain. Um, and she does say, like, she did say one of her proudest achievements was winning the women's Epe at the Leeds Open in 2012. So basically, the Epe is just one of the forms of the little sword thingies. We don't fence a lot, but it's it's one of the it's one of the types, basically. We don't fence a lot like Courtney and I have ever fenced in our My entire life. My only experience with fencing is parent trap. Same, same. Also, again, I'm really sad this is not a video podcast because you guys missed Courtney's fencing hand gestures that whole time. So. <laughs> I mean, it sounds very fun, but. Maybe this is what we can do for our TikTok. Courtney and I convince each other. That would be hilarious. Courtney, bachelorette party. This seems like a good time. It's like how I met your mother when uh, Ted and uh, Marshall <laughs> yes. start sword fighting and like stab <laughs> Lily in the shoulder. That's going to be, I'm going to somehow be fencing and get stabbed at the same time. I don't know. It, that will, That would happen to you. After Alice graduated, she stayed in Newcastle, and she eventually secured a job at media giant Sky's Newcastle Hub. Um, And she was quickly promoted to site coordinator and personal assistant to the head of sales. And all of her coworkers had really nice things to say about her. So in early 2016, Alice did begin a brief relationship with Treeman Dillon. So Treeman Dillon was a soldier serving with two Scots based at Pennycook, south of Edinburgh. Again, I hope all that's right. (laughs) Um, He was born in India, and he was an only child of a devout Sikh household. Um, And his parents moved a lot because his father was in the military. And he did go to college at Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh. And when he moved here, he decided to start going by Harry. So Dylan loved studying abroad and being away from his parents because he was like, you know, I grew up in this very strict household. And, you know, once once those kids of strict households get out, they go wild. They go so wild. Jacqueline knows this from experience. Not Jacqueline herself, but... <laughs> uh, yes, someone Jacqueline knows. Yes. <laughs> so he started partying frequently, drinking heavily, and seeing a lot of women. Like, he was like, this is my time to shine. Um, and they're all things his parents would not have approved of. So he's like, would mom and dad approve? No, I'm going to do it. Yep. And once he graduated, he joined the British army and he rose to the rank of Lance Corporal. So Alice had been introduced to him online by a mutual friend while he was serving a non-combat role in Afghanistan. And they officially met in January of 2016. So they spent a week together in Newcastle and then a week together in Edinburgh. And then he had to return to Afghanistan for his final two-month tour of duty. Um, He was very charming and he was very attentive and like had this caring behavior that, you know, you just kind of get swept up in because you're like, oh, this is amazing. Um... But as it happens, this soon changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Once he did return to the UK in April, Alice's friends and coworkers noticed that her behavior started to change. She was becoming very withdrawn and distracted. She started losing weight. She stopped socializing, and she did have a falling out with her roommates. So she moved into a new ground floor apartment in Gateshead with her coworker, uh, Maxine McGill. So, you know, at this time, everyone's like, this is this very bubbly, outgoing, you know, girl, and she's completely 180, completely different. Mm -hmm. During this time, Dylan was becoming very critical of her appearance and the way she lived her life. So he was critical of her friends and family, and he, she did steadily become more isolated from them. So he didn't like it when she would go out. He didn't like when she would drink. He didn't like her wearing makeup or dressing nicely. So he's just being, like, very critical of basically everything about her. And if you look at pictures, mm-hmm. this girl is beautiful. Like, you mm-hmm. let her live her life. She did not need to do listen to any of this, what this guy was saying. It's like he just tried to find every possible thing to, like, tear her down mm-hmm. and control her that he could. And he'd also taken control of her Facebook account by changing the password. 
Um, she did later shut this account down and start a new one. Um, but if she spoke to another man, he accused her of flirting and being unfaithful. So it's like just speaking. She, he accused her of that. Um, and Dylan's behavior had a noticeable effect on Alice. Um, you know, in just these few months, she went from being happy, outgoing, vibrant, to just miserable and lonely. And even her work was being affected. Um, her family even commented on a family trip how just withdrawn and unhappy Alice was. After a few months, Alice was contacted by a woman who said Dylan had wanted to start a relationship with her. So this Alice is like, I'm ending this relationship. I can't trust this man anymore. I'm miserable. Um, and while Dylan had been demanding her like total loyalty to him, like you talk to someone else, like he'd been cheating on her and like talking to other women, have sex, mm -hmm. having sex with other women, like completely cheating on her. Yeah. However, Dylan was not willing to accept the end of this relationship. Um, he bombarded Alice with text, phone calls, voice messages, and emails. In some, he was just pleading for her to come back. In others, he was very aggressive and threatening. Um, in one message, he said he was not being used. He was not used to being denied what quote belonged to him. Gross. Yep. So during August and September, Alice received more messages from Dylan from several different phones. So he would profess his undying love, and then he would threaten emotional blackmail. He would start crying in these messages and threatening to kill himself. Um, in some, he was even threatening to release compromising photos he took of Alice. Um, and Dylan was just becoming, like, obsessed with Alice. Like, clearly, like, he's spending his whole day just messaging her from every phone every possible way mm -hmm. so at first she tried to respond she was trying to be pleasant you know trying not to have just a horrible breakup um but eventually she just like grew tired of this and he'd lost any chance of them getting back together so when alice started ignoring dylan's messages he started contacting her friends and family trying to get them to influence her so at this time, he also hacked her social media accounts, and he was reading every message she sh sent or received. Mm. So, um, he knew who she was speaking to, where she was, and at the beginning of September, he found out Alice had started a new relationship with a man named Mike, who was an army officer. Um, so, Dylan is like, well, now I have to destroy this relationship. And he contacted Mike and told him lies about Alice and tried to convince him that Alice was cheating on him. But Mike did know about Dylan and what he'd been putting Alice through, and he didn't believe him. He was like, dude, I, I know what you're doing. I can see through you. <laughs> um, and Mike and Alice were actually doing really well. Um, her roommate, Maxine, would let her say, later say, Mike made her very happy. She told me that. She had a great couple of days with her sister and Mike. It was a strong bond between two people. They got on like a house on fire and said the banter between them was unreal. That's how she put it. Mm. So on September 30th, Dylan repeatedly rang Alice's doorbell and then would hide when she looked through the peephole. So she was concerned it was him because... You know, if he keeps hiding when you're looking through the peephole, you don't really know. But you're like, okay, who else is going to be knocking on my door yeah. like this? Um, who and else will be doing this? <laughs> yeah. So she decided not to answer the door. Um, a few hours later, Dylan climbed over the fence into the back garden and tapped on Alice's window while she laid in bed. So if you remember from earlier, she was living in that ground floor apartment. Um, so when she opened the curtains, she saw flowers and chocolate and Dylan was slowly backing away. Mm. Yeah. So Dylan then drove back to Edinburgh. Now, from where Alice lives to where Dylan is living in Edinburgh is a two and a half hour drive. So this is a long drive. And you'll see coming up, he makes this drive a lot. So you can't mm -hmm. really say like, he didn't have time to think or anything because <laughs> he's got a two and a half hour drive <laughs> to do this crazy shit. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and while he was driving back to Edinburgh, he left Alice a voicemail where he kept saying he didn't want to kill her and wouldn't kill her. Like, he just kept being like, I'm not going to kill you. I don't want to kill you. I'm not going to kill you, which... If you have to, like, say to someone, I'm not going to kill you, there's a reason for them to think that you want to kill them. Yeah. So, at this point, Alice did contact the police. Um, so, they were initially very sympathetic, and they told her, like, okay, we're, we're going to stop him. Um, so, they labeled the crime as harassment and issued a police 
information notice um, or a pin. Again, from a Google search, because I'm not <laughs> British. Um, I don't have a British correspondence. If you want to be our British correspondence, please let us know. Please do. Um, that would be lovely. <laughs> yeah. So it appears that like when a pin is issued, so the alleged usually harasser is contacted and told your behavior is unacceptable. Um, I think they're supposed to sign it, acknowledging it. Like, I think it has to be one of those things where you're like, I know you're telling mm-hmm. me this. So it's kind of like an official warning, it seems to me, where it's okay. like, you know, we know that you're doing some shady shit. Like, if you keep doing it, we have proof that you've done it in the past. Yeah. But again, let us know if we're off base. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the police also told her that with this pin, if he ever, ever, like, came near her again or contacted her, he would be arrested. So now Alice is, like, starting to feel like herself again. You know, you're starting to feel protected. You're regaining your self-confidence. You're like, okay, I'm being taken seriously. He won't hurt me. Um, all that. Yeah, like, she's like, okay, finally someone is, like, doing something. Things are going to get better. So, Dylan was notified of this pin on October 3rd in his barracks by his army superiors, and his colleagues and friends told him that he should stop trying to contact her, obviously, because, like, they see this and they're like, okay, bro, it's it's probably time to to leave that alone. Um, However, he immediately sent her a package with a letter and some other items, and in this letter, he complained about how she had called the police, and he's like, oh, I'm facing all these repercussions because of it. Um, He said they had taken away his laptop, his iPod, his phone, which was all a lie. Mm -hmm. None of that happened. Um, But in the letter, he wrote, I'm in a lot of shit now, but I hope you feel happy. I'm sending you everything I have that reminds me of you as you belong to another man. Wishing you two a happy life. I will never come into your life again. So Alice received this package on October 7th and contacted the police again because obviously he's not supposed to have any contact with her. Um, But the police were less sympathetic this time and they didn't do anything about it. Um, So Alice is obviously getting frustrated because she's like, what else am I supposed to do? Like, it feels like this is never going to stop. If like I I reached out, I got this pin, it didn't change anything. He's still doing it. Mm -hmm. She's like, I don't know what else to do. Um, Because unfortunately the pin, it seems, doesn't really hold any like legal weight. Like we said, it was more kind of like a formal warning type situation. And the police had like originally told her like, if he violates it, he'll be arrested. Like, they were, like, acting yeah. like, this is your protection. And now they're like, no, it doesn't. What are you talking about? Like, yeah. It's like, this isn't a protective order. This is just us saying, hey, don't do that. Yeah. And not really being able to do anything with that. Um, so the police tell her that arresting Dylan isn't an option. So basically, she's just wasting police time now. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously, now she's really scared. She feels unsafe. And she tried to have a coworker drive her home every day. Like, she's double locking her door, just doing everything she can to try to keep herself safe. So on October 10th, Dylan drove to Alice's house again, climbed into the back garden, and photographed her rear window. Um, But Alice was not aware of this. And then on October 12th, Dylan drove down from Edinburgh again. Um, He parked near her apartment and waited for her to return home. And while he waited, he was actually messaging another girl to arrange a meeting with her later that evening in Scotland. So around six o'clock that night, Dylan climbed over the back wall and forced his way in through a window. He picked up a sharp knife and cornered Alice in the bathroom. So police believe it was likely that Dylan kneeled on her back and held her head up when he slashed her throat at least six times. Um, He cut almost completely through to her spine and she did suffer 24 injuries, including defensive wounds. Um, But Dylan had no wounds. Yeah. Nothing. Um, her roommate, Maxine McGill, returned home shortly after and found her, and Dylan was arrested a few hours later at his barracks. Um, he was caught attempting to climb out over a wall, and he denied any knowledge of Alice's murder, but there was overwhelming evidence to take him to trial. My favorite thing is when, like, murderers are like, I don't know anything about it, and it's like, then why were you running when we came? Like, mm-hmm. especially in these, like, you're trying to climb over a wall, like, you're trying to run, like, especially, like, these where it's, like, blatantly obvious. It's, like, yeah. you can't say you don't know when you saw us coming and you're, like, oh, shit, oh, gotta I get better out of here. run. And they're, like, oh, I had nothing to do with this. Okay. It's, like, Brian Laundry again. Like, clearly mm-hmm. you know yeah. you're a suspect. You more than likely did it. If he didn't do it, I don't know. <laughs> Is that an option at this point? But you know what I mean? Like, come yeah. on now. 
come on now. <laughs> yeah. And this isn't a situation of you getting an attorney to keep yourself safe like we've talked about. Like, you running mm-hmm. is a completely different situation. Yeah. So during the trial, Dylan appeared very cold and unemotional. Um, He tried to tell the jury that Alice's death was an accident. He said that she was leaping at him, and he tried to defend himself and disarm her, and she cut herself when he blocked a lunge. Yeah. He then Mm -hmm. said that the knife stuck in her neck when she fell on the floor. Okay. Like, you remember the description we just gave of her injuries, right? Like, there, there's no way that's what happened. Yeah. Like, this is complete bullshit. There's no and way. And Dylan had no injuries. So, in this scenario, you would have injuries like defensive wounds if you're protecting yourself from yeah. her. So, it's like, how mm-hmm. do you come out of this with no defensive, like, nothing? And she has all these injuries. Mm-hmm. Like, come on now, sir. Yeah. So they also played Maxine's 999 call for the jury. So Maxine describes finding Alice covered in blood. And on this call, she said that it was Dylan that killed her. Um, And she also called him an absolute psychopath. She testified at Alice's attempts to contact police about Dylan's behavior. And the jury also heard about Alice and Dylan's relationship and his controlling behavior, including alienating her from her family and friends. So Dylan's previous partner had a similar situation, um, but their ordeal only ended in a restraining order. But there was a clear pattern here that this had happened before. Um, So the restraining order was issued because after they broke up, he tracked her down, called her a bitch, and spat in her face. Um, So he was charged with assault, but he accepted the restraining order, so the charges were dropped. So nothing more came of that. Yeah. Yeah. So the jury did find Dylan guilty of Alice's murder. Um, He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 22 years. So the judge called this murder an act of utter barbarism. Um, There have also been talks of transporting Dylan back to his native country of India to finish his sentence. Um, But Alice's parents, Clive and Sue, are really against this because they fear that he will be released early if he's transferred to India. Um, And Sue says that she wants to be kept informed of his release and, like, whether her family is in danger or not. Um, She said that he had made threats against them. um, And she was quoted as saying, if he goes back to his home country, that would mean we wouldn't know where he is. We wouldn't be given information every year like we are now. We would just be constantly worried that he would be released without our knowledge. Yeah, because that is so scary. You know, he has made threats against his family. And you're like, well, if you just send him back to India, like, you're not going to be keeping track of him. I don't know if India is going to take this seriously because they weren't here for the crime. Like, what about us? <laughs> You're not protecting us. Yeah, and like, how does that work with like sharing country, share, sharing information among different countries? Like, are they going to reach out to them to give updates, you know? So clearly, Dylan had done this before, like we said, was stalking his previous ex girlfriend, um, and he really showed no remorse over Alice's murder. Um, so, who's to say that he's not going to do something like that again if he's released? And the Ministry of Justice released a statement saying, while we are determined to punish and deport foreign national offenders, this would only happen where an appropriate sentence is guaranteed to be served overseas. So, like, we're only going to release him if we're guaranteed that he will serve a similar sentence. Mm Mm-hmm. So in October of 2017, the Independent Office for Police Conduct launched an investigation on the handling of Alice's case. And in September of 2018, they released their findings saying they did find two cases of misconduct. So they failed to investigate Alice's stalking, and the sergeant did not properly supervise the constable during the investigation. Um, So they were disciplined, which is how you know this case happened in the UK and not the United States, because... Police are never held accountable for their mistakes here. Yep. Um, And the police did apologize to Alice's family for their failures in handling the case. Um, Alice's family is also fighting really hard to get a stalker's registry into law that could possibly help prevent cases like this. Like, if you can easily see, hey, this new person that I just met has a history of being a stalker, you know, that would probably be a good thing to know. (laughs) And especially when Alice called the police the first time and they did take her, you know, Mm -hmm. seriously that first time, if there was a stalker's registry and they could see, oh my gosh, he's done this to a girl in the past, Mm -hmm. maybe they would have taken it more seriously and been like, when she said, I got a package from him, they wouldn't be like, oh, it's just a package, like whatever. Like maybe they would have taken this more seriously because Mm -hmm. this guy has this history. Yeah. Like we'll, we'll talk about this more in just a second, but you see that pattern and that escalation and... Yeah. 
hopefully it would make it easier for something to be done. So if you are listening to this on the day it is released, it is the first Tuesday in October. Um, And October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So this month is a time to speak about domestic violence, raise awareness, and support survivors. Um, It did start in October of 1981 by the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, Domestic violence can happen to anyone. In the United States, over 10 million adults experience domestic experience domestic violence annually and based on a report from the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence, one in four women and one in ten men will experience domestic violence in their life. Obviously the COVID-19 pandemic did not help this um, because everyone was locked in their house so if you are living with an abuser your situation is going to be much worse and you're going to have much less likely of a chance of getting out of that. And it's so much harder because it's like so many people lost their jobs during the pandemic. And so if you are a woman who's trying to leave, you might not even have the funds. Like you might not even have a job or something to do to get money to try and leave. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just really, really stuck. Yeah. So Dr. Jane Moncton Smith is a criminology expert in the UK. And she believes that she found an eight stage pattern in 372 killings that occurred in the UK. So 30,000 women around the world were killed by current or former partners in 2017. And Dr. Moncton Smith said that women account for more than 80% of victims killed by their partners. And most of the time that partner is male. So this is why she tried to build this eight stage pattern recognition. Um, She studied women's death by partner um, and included men's deaths as well if they were killed by their male partner. So the eight steps that she discovered were a pre-relationship history of stalking or abuse by the perpetrator, the romance developing quickly into a serious relationship, the relationship being dominated by coercive control, a trigger to threaten the perpetrator's control. So for example, the relationship ends or the perpetrator is in financial difficulty, Um, then begins escalation, which is an increase in the intensity or frequency of the partner's control tactics, such as stalking or threatening suicide. And the perpetrator then has a change in thinking, um, choosing to move on either through revenge or homicide. And the perpetrator will then start planning. So they might buy weapons or seek opportunities to get the victim alone. And then in the final step, the perpetrator will kill their partner or possibly harm their children or both. So in Dr. Moncton Smith's research, there was only one stage that was not always followed. And that was the first stage of previous behavior. And it would possibly be because the perpetrator had not had a previous relationship before. So they didn't really have that to go off of. Um, And she mentions Mm -hmm. how like for so long, we've just painted this narrative of it being a crime of passion. It's like the heat of the moment, but it's really not true in these domestic violence cases. Like, And, like, we might be able to prevent them. Yeah. You know, if we can know these patterns, and, I mean, we'll talk about it in a second. Like, if you listen listen to those eight and then listen to the story we just told, I mean, it's like we gave an example for each one. Exactly. Um, And this is in a lot of cases. So, it's like, if we know these patterns, maybe we can prevent these, you know, partners from, like, from dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Courtney said, like, obviously, we just demonstrated all of these, you know, if police had known this, maybe they would have taken Alice more seriously, if they could see this pattern, this escalation, they know this is how it's typically happened in the past in other relationships. Um, Obviously, Dylan was on stage five when Alice contacted the police. And Alice's family really want Dr. Moncton Smith's stages to be more widely known, um, because this could have saved Alice and it could save someone else in the future as well. Um, So we also just want to say if you are currently a victim of domestic abuse or you know someone who is a victim, please reach out to the National Domestic Hotline. They do have advocates available 24-7. That number is 1-800-787-3244, which is also SAFE, so 1-800-787-SAFE. They also have a chat option on their website, which is hotline.org. And you can also text START to 88788. Um, Unfortunately, domestic abuse is all too common. It affects men, women, non-binary individuals, every age, race, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, religion, and nationality. Um, Anyone can be a victim, so please do not be scared to seek help if you or someone you know is in this situation. Yeah, and, um, you know, these 
these stories we do with like these like stalking and stuff, they do hit close to home for me. Obviously, my case was better, but I, you know, I did have a relationship that ended and it was a lot of messages and a lot of kind of stalking after Mm -hmm. the fact. Um, So it's always just kind of like scary to think of how it could have ended up. Um, I could be Alice, you know, like. Especially when you look at that eight stage pattern and you can like check off so many of them, you know? Yeah. So, um, and if you do know someone or love someone who's being a victim of domestic abuse, I know it's really hard sometimes to like talk to them, um, but just be there for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, their abuser is going to try to isolate them, but keep reaching out and keep being there for them. And I know it's really draining and really hard, but you just have to keep being there because one day they're going to need you and they you don't don't let that abuser like isolate you from their life basically like I know it's hard but just try to keep being there and try to just keep it's a very tricky situation you can't really like make someone see it or know um until like they're ready but if you can be there for them um that's really helpful too and we know it's hard but please don't like give them an ultimatum of oh if you don't leave your partner like I'm not going to be here um, because that's exactly what their partner wants you know so Mm -hmm. recognize how hard it is to leave that relationship and be there for whenever it is that they are ready try to get them help acknowledge that there's nothing you can do until they're ready to get help unfortunately but stay there until they are because sometimes by the time they are they've lost everyone because of their abuser so um just please keep that in mind if you know someone like this yeah i mean you definitely if you have to take a step back but just don't give that ultimatum and just completely yeah don't have any contact because they are going to need someone and that abuser is going to try to get everyone away from them yeah just always leave that door open and as always we do want to remember the victims um and that is alice ruggles um the alicesruggles.org um, that is by her family and so they do have a lot of pictures a lot of inf- a lot of the information in this came from that because they tell her story and talk about her um, and they're just constantly trying to do things um, I know during the month of September they asked people to sign up to do 24 things because she was born on December 24th um, just like little ways to just like raise awareness basically um, and so they just keep trying to remember her and trying to keep her story out there and just help other women um, and men who are victims of this and just trying to prevent Mm -hmm. more deaths like this. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, this was uh, almost super sad and especially with all of the updates in the beginning, um, so many of them, you know, revolving around domestic violence or, you know, just relationships turning deadly and things like that. So just, you know, please be safe and reach out if you guys need help. And Courtney, what is your perk of the week? Okay, my perk of the week is going to be that for the moment, at the time of this recording, it feels like fall Mm -hmm. and I think it's supposed to get Mm -hmm. hot again. But right now it has been like in the high 60s, 50s, 60s. It has felt so wonderful outside. I don't walk outside and sweat my butt off and I don't, you know, (laughs) it's the perfect, uh, you know, you just put on a jacket and you feel good and a little bit chilly and it's just, I love fall. We usually do not get fall in Tennessee. It usually just kind of goes from Mm -hmm. hot to cold to hot again in December, (laughs) kind of. You might get a little bit of cold, but not long. (laughs) We, we get fall days. We don't get fall as a season. Yeah. <laughs> so. so you get like every once in a while one of those. Um, but it has felt so nice outside. It is just my favorite. Fall is my favorite in general with like football and pumpkin things and the holidays coming up. And mm-hmm. I do like summer, but sometimes it just gets too hot. So once it starts cooling off, that's just my sweet spot. So um, that is my perk of the week that it's been some beautiful days that I can enjoy And I'm going to enjoy them while I can before days start getting shorter and colder. So, yeah, (laughs) that is my perk of the week. Jacqueline, what is your perk of the week? 
So my perk of the week, because we've also been having lovely weather here, um, a little bit warmer, like mid seventies, you know, which to me is like the perfect weather, like not too chilly. But it's not so hot that you're immediately sweating and you can actually be outside for long periods of time <laughs> yeah. and you can breathe, you know, those wonderful things. Um, so because of that, we went on our first hike with the baby today. Um, so we went up to the uh, state park and we took the baby and the dogs and I wore her and we thought we were going on like a three mile hike, but my watch said 4.5 when we finished <laughs> because I think we took a wrong turn somewhere, which tends to happen when we go hiking. <laughs> but That's why I texted um, you and said, don't get lost. Cause I remember that one time and you were like, I don't really know where we are. <laughs> yep. I was like, I don't know when we're Did you we're uh, have back. to carry Dolly that last 1.5 miles or did she, uh, did she, she, she was a trooper. She made it. We, we had a few close calls <laughs> where, uh, Andrew had to kind of hold treats in his hand the whole time to like mm-hmm. keep her. So like he was in front of us with Rosie and then Dolly had to, Dolly's my beagle and Dolly will go about three miles and then just stop and just lay on the ground. So. She's like, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm done. I was like, hopefully not. Cause I can't carry this baby and this dog. Cause that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but Millie loved the hike. She was a huge fan. Um, I had her in her carrier. I usually face her like towards me because she usually like snuggles up, but I turned her around where she could see everything and she was like all about that. So she was <laughs> loving it. Um, so yeah, so that is my perk of the week. If you guys want to tell us about your good weather, um, bad weather, fall things. Um, speaking of fall, I have a pumpkin spice latte in the refrigerator that I'm going to drink Ooh, when we finish that this. That good. Um, super excited. Um, I got it at Starbucks on the way home from my hike, but I saved it. So, (laughs) um, so yeah, if you want to tell us all of those lovely things, you can do so on Instagram at caffeinated crimes pod. We are on Twitter at calf crimes pod. That's C A F F crimes pod. We are on Facebook at caffeinated crimes podcast. You can email us at caffeinated crimes pod at gmail.com. Um, we are also on YouTube and TikTok now. Um, YouTube, I think, is just Caffeinated Crimes Podcast. Mm-hmm. TikTok is something. I'm sure you just Caffeinated search Crimes us. Pod, I think. You'll find <laughs> us. You know you know what our logo yeah. is, guys. It's okay. So, yeah, do all those things. Um, oh, we also have a shout-out for our newest Patreon subscriber. Um, so, thank mm-hmm. you, Ashton. We greatly appreciate you. We are very happy that you are in our Patreon community, and we love you very much. Yes. And um, as we said before, Ashton is also the one who created our logo. Yes. So she's a, she's a real one. <laughs> um, we also still have our Apple Reviews giveaway going on. Um, so once we get to 50, we're getting closer. But once we get to 50, I think we're only 22 away now. Closer. We have 38, I think. or 12? We just got another one. 38 would be 12. Mm-hmm. Courtney's great at math again. <laughs> Gonna but you know what? I want 22. I want 22 more reviews, yes. though. I'm manifesting 20, 22 more reviews, even though we only need 12. <laughs> um. We need 22 more by 2022. That's our new goal, guys. That's our new goal. Okay. Sorry, guys. My, I'm a little brain dead lately. I just <laughs> burnt out brain is real. <laughs> Don't really know where I am or what's happening. Anyway. Go to Apple Reviews, the little purple icon on your phone. Um, Click it. Go to our podcast. You can review it. Um, Unfortunately, you can't really do it on any of the other sites Mm -hmm. that I know of. um, And we're just doing Apple Reviews. So if you could just find someone who has a phone or I wonder if you can do it on your Mac. I don't know. Anyway, (laughs) just find a way to review us. Uh, Please give us five stars and and leave something that identifies that it's you. Um, If you want, you can screenshot it and send it to Mm -hmm. us if you don't want to put like anything at all um just do that before you submit it not after because then we can't actually know it was you um and you can just send us to that to any of the places we've mentioned before um so yeah once we get to 50 we're gonna pick a name and you'll get a pen a sticker and a ten dollar gift card to the coffee shop of your choice um you can get your own pumpkin spice latte if you hurry it up um (laughs) maybe a peppermint mocha by the time we get there or maybe i don't know anyway (laughs) do all that Talk to us all those places. Again, if you need help, that number is 1-800-787-3244. You can also text START to 88788. Just want to repeat that again in case you need it um, for you or someone you know. And um, in the meantime, go have a cup of coffee. And don't commit a crime. Mm-hmm.